This is Reasons We Serve, a channel dedicated to the women and men in law enforcement. Episode 29, Part 1, Former Border Patrol Agent Larry Roberts. Episode 29 is a two-part episode with Larry Roberts. To say that Larry has had a storied career does not do him justice. Part 1 of this episode focuses on Larry's time with the United States Border Patrol. From 1984 until 1989, Larry worked the border between Mexico and California. During this time, Larry became part of a specialized Border Patrol unit called the Border Crime Prevention Unit. During the time the unit was together, they were involved in 41 shootings that resulted in the wounding of United States law enforcement personnel, as well as the deaths and arrests of people known as bandits. The team's only focus was the targeting of bandits that were involved in the rape, robbery, and murder of illegal aliens attempting to get into the United States. The stories told by Larry may sound familiar to those true crime experts who have read the book Lines and Shadows by Joseph Wamba, which is a nonfiction book published in 1984. Part two of this episode focuses on Larry with the Drug Enforcement Administration. In part two, Larry talks about his time with DEA working large-scale narcotics investigations. The stories he relates are those while he was stationed in California, as well as while he was stationed in Mexico. Many of the stories he tells are very similar to the movie Sicario, with the exception being that his stories are real. This is his story. Can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Larry Roberts. And Larry, um, can you talk about growing up and where you grew up? And was there anything growing up, anything you did growing up that uh, led you to law enforcement? I grew up in a small town in Washington State. Um, BF Egypt is closer to town than where I was born. It's a little town called Oroville, Washington. To get to Spokane to catch the airplane, it's about a, almost a four-hour drive. So I grew up there. My father was a uh, had been born on the same farm, well, born in Nebraska, but raised on the same farm. Uh, my great grandparents, my grandparents, and then my dad, all in the same house or the same farm. Um, as a child, as he had about a total by the time he reached max, maybe. About 100 acres of apple orchard, so I'd work in the apple orchard every summer and harvest, and I knew that's not something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, and so as a kid, I started skiing at five, six years old in the local ski area. Kept getting better. Then I started going to races. Then I raced in Canada all over. I had my Canadian race card because being born in the town I was, it's only four miles from the Canadian border. So it's easier to go race in Canada than drive two and a half hours in the U.S. to get to another ski area of quality. Did that for a while, and I started ski racing for a Mission Ridge ski team. Uh, God, that'd be 70s, somewhere early 70s. I didn't go to high school, per se. I ski raced. I'd go to class like two days a week and ski the rest of the time. Then my last year... I went to college, lived in the girls' dorm, and that was marvelous. Uh, yes. And um, went to college in the mornings from 7.30 to 10.30. Both got high school credit and college credit at the same time. And we go race all over Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Alaska. Ended up going to junior nationals and NORAM races. And, uh, and then about 20, I ended up getting a girlfriend and... She later became my wife until she had a problem keeping her pants on. And then she became not my wife and became somebody else's problem. Uh, true story. <laughs> and um, so ski raced. I was never home. Uh, we had two guys, one guy, John, Lomb John Lombard, and another Jane Henry die on our ski team, crashing. Uh, ski team, I teammate nobody really liked him because he's a jerk uh but he won the olympic medal gold medal downhill in uh, uh olympics billy johnson then once i uh, got married and had a child i went to college full-time at washington state university 
got a degree in political science, another degree in sociology, a uh, major in history, and a minor in communications. And when I graduated, there were no jobs. Uh, wonderful Jimmy Carter, epitome of a Democrat, was the president of the United States. I remember in graduation, almost graduating, a uh, bunch of the college graduates spelled on the top of their caps, and they're sitting in a row unemployed. It was the coolest thing I ever saw. There were no jobs when I got out of college, so I went to the exciting world of selling life insurance, which sucked. Uh, then I ended up going to work for uh, Washington State Conservation Corps as a supervisor. To, at, I was, what, 24, 25 then, uh, teaching young kids how to, their first job, cutting down trees. I had 25 kids working for me, <clears throat> which is a good job. Probably would have been a career job in the, for the state government, but I'd always wanted to go into law enforcement. And, and why is that? Was there something that happened? I just kids? always... I. I guess it's the challenge, the excitement. Um, other people do it for more patriotic reasons. I love the challenge and excitement. I, In my 28 years of law enforcement, I got paid to be 16 years old my whole life. It was the best paying job to be 16 years old, even though I was old. Um, and so I uh, was doing that and applied for Border Patrol. It took about two years to get hired, and I'm sitting there now supervisor for the Conservation Corps for Washington State. You want to become a Border Patrol agent? Sure. You're going to Brownfield Station. Well, where the heck is that? It took me, because this is long before the internet. So you had to go look on maps and go to the library and found out it was in San Diego, California, up in the mountains. All right, cool. So I showed up at the academy and I uh, had no notice to get in shape the whole day. I'd been in great shape when I skied. But then I wasn't, and so went to the Border Patrol Academy two weeks' notice. That was in 1984, back before computers started. Went to the Border Patrol Academy at, in uh, Glencoe, Georgia. Didn't know where that was either. So, Larry, before you go on to that, why, why Border Patrol? Was there any other agencies you were looking at? I knew nothing about law enforcement. I knew I wanted to go into it. And there's a Border Patrol station in Orville, Washington. And a couple of my buddies... Fathers were Border Patrol agents. I didn't know much about it. Um, sounded like a good idea. And so I put in and went. That's kind of how it ended up. It's like, oh, that works. And uh, next thing I knew, I was on a plane flying. Uh, first, I flew from out of Spokane all the way to San Diego and reported there. For two weeks, I sat there in San Diego um, at the training facility for U.S. Border Patrol, San Diego Sector. I forgot about all this, just remember it now. And so sitting there, bright, you know, big eyes a whole bit. And that was around June of 1984. So showed up there, Border Patrol, and I just, just remember this now, sitting there with, uh, there were about 10 of us, plus or minus, from San Diego going to the academy. So sitting there, I remember sitting in the training room and you're filling first week out of the two weeks, just paperwork, every form, you know, as the government, your life insurance and your retirement, blah, 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 blah. Sitting there, I remember sitting there and we're sitting there. All of a sudden this guy walked in, border patrol green uniform, but he had a gun on his hip, had an upside down knife on his load bearing strap things and had two guns on him. And I'm looking, who's that? Oh, we just started this new team. It's called the, the Border Crime Prevention Unit. What's that? They only chase down the people who rob, rape, and kill the illegal aliens in the canyon tonight, which was epitomized in Joseph Wambaugh's book, Lines and Shadows, uh, which was, and that book was about San Diego police with one Border Patrol agent and one Customs Patrol officer, which is like, you know, like a DEA Border Patrol agent. Uh, and they just hunt down the people raping, raping, robbing, killing the aliens. And uh, and that was called the Border Alien Robbery Force back in the late 70s, I believe, early 80s, and from Lanes and Shadows. And so that got disbanded. They, a good team, but got disbanded too many shootings. So they started this new team to target the, uh, we called them bandits, but the people rape, rob, and kill illegal aliens. I thought, wow, that's cool. Never thought about it again. So I go to the academy in uh, Glencoe, Georgia, spend, what, four months there in one hurricane, 
Okay, got interrupted by a noisy dog. It's all good. So you were talking about uh, going to Fletzy in 1984 and kind of what training was about. So I went to Fletzy, which is in Glencoe, Georgia, which, you know, again, no internet, so it's hard to find out where it was at. Went right there. Um, and it was four or five months of training. Spanish was really hard for me at the beginning. I now speak Spanish probably about three, three plus on the State Department scale. What, um, what's the highest? Uh, five, I think. Okay. I think four, you're basically considered like having a master's in Spanish. So you're fluent. Yeah, I, my wife's from Mexico, so we, I speak Spanish. I mean, it got better way later, but I barely passed the Spanish course at uh, uh, Border Patrol Academy. Um, you went through all the stuff, uh, high-speed driving, skid pan, Changing lanes, all the stuff you see in police movies at their academies. Went through that. Went through the firearms. Being a hunter, firearms is pretty easy for me. You know, pistol, rifle, shotgun. At that time, when we shot rifles, it was a 308 bolt action. And they would have plastic bullets at the end on the range so it didn't tear up the range. You had to qualify with a 308. And they had to qualify the shotgun, and and I was issued a three fifty seven Magnum Model sixty six uh, Smith and Wesson stainless steel. And in the early days of the Border Patrol, you were not allowed to carry speed loaders. You had a choice of a six loop or twelve loop uh, on your belt, and you learned an index. Take your, you'd open up the revolver, and you'd hold the. Uh, Cylinder, and you take two rounds at a time. Dump two rounds as fast as you can go. That's how you practice shooting all the time. So that was the only thing you carry, either six extra bullets or 12 extra bullets. So you went through the whole academy through that. Um, I was married, so it was more difficult. You know, a lot of collect calls, no cell phones in those days. And so the academy is, you know, okay, like any other academy. You well, get. Was there anything specifically that they taught you being in Border Patrol that – you know, maybe they aren't teaching you at a different academy, like DEA academy. Probably the best thing you learn, well, you go through Spanish classes, and immigration law is pretty much, uh, this is a law on odd months with even days and only a full moon. Then it changes to this law. So immigration law makes absolutely no sense at, at all. I mean, it's like, okay, and then to pass the academy, you have to pass a Spanish test and a law test. And we got obviously you're driving and shooting all those you have to pass, but you have to pass the uh, law test. And you had these. <laughs> to listen to my dog <laughs> over there crying. So you have to memorize these charts on immigration law. There's five charts. So the minute you sit down to take the test, you write out the whole chart, and then you re refer it. When all the when you're taking the test on what the laws are, so that you learn at the beginning is to memorize the charts, which is a chart that outlines all of immigration law, and then you have to take your Spanish test, which I barely passed. So you finish all that. Um, but Board Pro is known for training. Going back to the guns, for training very good shots, because you don't just start shooting. You're, you're dry fire for the first couple of days, then you put two bullets in it, and turn the cylinder. You know, it's going to click, click, bang. Then three bolts. Then finally just six. Then it's draw and fire, draw and fire, draw and fire. Um, one thing about Border Patrol, they had the highest number of officer-involved shootings of any agency at the time, and they'd had the most people ever killed have been in Border Patrol. What, why was that? Uh, just on the border. They Border Patrol started in the 30s. Just you're by yourself all the time in those stations. So... That was Border Patrol. I mean, you know, get your green uniform. You go through all the academy, you walk around, you're in full uniform, but you ain't, you have no badge. And you learn to salute, march. I couldn't march and step down to save my life if I had to, but I learned there. You know, and it was all new. I'd never been in the military. And probably half the guys in our, my Border Patrol class had been in the military. And how old, how old were you at the time? 25 or 26, right around there. So just still a young man. Um, I thought it was really smart and responsible at the time. I realized how irresponsible I was with, you know, just compared to as you get older in life. But academy was fun. I mean, it's a long four, 
17 weeks at the time, but we had one week, I think we got extended a week due to a hurricane that came through. So it was about 18 weeks. So it's at four and a half months, four months in a week, four and a half months. So it was a long time. And so how do you, when you're going through the academy, do they tell you where you're going to go? Or are you, do they tell you at the end? How does that work? Yeah, that's different. The DEA Academy, they don't tell you. Border Patrol, I knew I was going to Brownfield Station, San Diego. So I flew down to San Diego first before I went there. Went through all the training. Um, I never saw my station. It was just the the central training area. So I knew where I was going to go, but I'd never been to that station. It was a part of San Diego sector. San Diego sector for Border Patrol, Clevers, San Clemente, which is up by Oceanside. Another station called Chula Vista Station, which handles the west side of the border. At that time, there's no Imperial Beach. And then Brownfield, which handled the mountains. Then there was an Elkhorn Station and a Campo Station way out in the mountains, halfway to El Centro. And so, God, at that time, there were only maybe – the beginning, I was – my call sign was, what, 429, I think, or 4291. But there was a small number of agents in the whole area. Uh, years later, then they added, well, about a year later, about 85, 86, they added another station in along the border called Imperial Beach. So the Brownfield Station handled all the mountains, the rural area. Chula Vista and Imperial Beach handled the southern city of San Diego. And, you know, then they go up and do stuff in town. Okay, so Larry, in 84, you transfer out or you're done with the Pletsy Academy and you ended up in San Diego. Tell me what you were working on. What was a typical case or investigation that you would work on? In- well, Border Patrol, they don't do many investigations. It, it's different investigations. All right. So when you show up from the academy, first thing you're assigned is to the training unit. And so you get two training officers and they spend, oh God, I think two months on the training unit. And while you're going through training, they show you the area. They show you where the sensors are for both vehicle and people as they cross the border at night. So you learn all the numbers and the call signs and uh, for each sensor and uh, all of that area familiarization, the rules at that sector. You also go one day a week uh, well, until you pass your six and then 10 month test. So you spent four months academy and you have to take a six month Spanish and law test. I passed law, no problem. Spanish, again, by the just a hair. I mean, and then same way, you have to pass a 10-month Spanish and law test. You fail either one, uh, you're out of the border patrol. You're, you're terminated. Now, many people that can't pass either one end up going to the, at that time, would go to the immigration service and work at the port of entry. So it, it's, it's a rough time because you're studying all night. Uh, you're studying law. If you're a native speaker it, coming in, it's a lot easier for you because you don't have to learn the Spanish. A few, a few had it because they spoke Spanish, but they couldn't read it or write it, which is still easier than anything else. And others were never educated in the language. So it wasn't their first language, but still easier than me who spoke nothing other than where's the bathroom, give me a beer. That's about it. So you do that. And then after the two months of learning all that, uh, you're sent to your unit. But I remember I'd probably, the first week of nights, I think is on the training unit, come to station and everybody was running around. Somebody and the guy was sitting in the station. He had been robbed. He, his wife and daughter, they'd shot him in the chest with a 22. He walked in the station asking him for help to uh, get back his wife and daughter who had both been raped by the bandits. And I was, I was thinking about that all that night. I go, wow, okay. That's what I want to do. And you'd see the team come and go. It's called the bandit details, what the Border Patrol called it. The name of the team was Border Crime Prevention Unit or the the San Diego Police called the Border Crime uh, Task Force. So I remember that. Then I finally got assigned to a unit. Um, I had uh, two supervisors, one very smart, but he never wanted anything to happen. The other never would that happen, but he was afraid of his own shadow. And so these are my two supervisors. Uh, about half the unit was really good. I had a partner who became kind of my training officer on that team after I got off the training unit. And uh, he'd been ex, uh, been in the military. He was 
assigned to CID buying drugs in Germany. And so he was a good training officer. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I spent the next probably two years, three, I was there for five years, probably the next three doing jet basic board patrol work, rotating shifts. At that time, the, there was really not a fence dividing the U.S. and Mexico other than a cable. The smugglers would cut down the fence. You'd have cars driving through the hole in the fence, smuggling people or drugs every night. My personal record, I like getting high-speed chases, which none of my bosses liked. Um, that's probably why they were always putting their thumb on me, which I couldn't really blame them. Uh, high-speed chases every night. My record one night was, I think, 13 failure to yields. Lights and siren, hundreds of miles an hour, all over southern Cal uh, southern San Diego, the border, the whole bit. Uh, you'd get drive a, do that. Um, I think a record was 13 cars that drove through the hole in the fence one night at the same time, one afternoon. And every agent on that shift, all six of us or nine of us are on the shift, uh, or because that's about all there'd be out there at the time, we would chase every car and push it back to Mexico, just start all over. Half the cars were stolen. It was a very wild time. You'd get shot at. That would Generally, they'd rock out your windows. you get close to the border. they th start throwing rocks at your car, take out all the windows. So now you're down having to go write a, a memo on how your car just got destroyed. You know, lost all its windows. A half hour, hour to write the report. And then turn that car in and then go get another one. That we didn't have them, but the Chula Vista station had what they called war wagons. They had screens up across all the windows. So guys would throw rocks and just dip the car. They'd use old beat up cars. They'd pull the, they had a rope that went through the roof and pull the screen up on the front. And there you go. You rock it all day. They don't care. And that was just every night. And so, Larry, we talked a little bit about this before we, we began. Can you talk about what the difference between working border patrol in your days was versus what it is today. Have there been any changes other than maybe there's certain sections of the border that with, there's a wall now? Yeah. Well, at that time there was no wall in San Diego. Um, the year I left and went to DEA 89, they started building a wall in San Diego and it coincided or it was immediately after they built the first wall in El Paso and started put, keeping the aliens out. Uh, but the nonstop coming across, it was an invasion. I mean, we would, San Diego sector would catch, what, a million aliens a year, or maybe all Border Patrol. It was nonstop. I mean, just over and over. But they didn't have this administration where if you just say, I want a deportation hearing to let you in, okay, you're going to go sit in jail for the next six months until we get to your deportation hearing. So all the aliens knew, just send them back, they'd cross again. Send them back, they'd cross. Sooner or later, they're going to get across. You know, it's just a law of attrition. I remember I caught one family at the same spot five nights in a row. It's like, he goes, where are you going to be at tomorrow? Well, obviously, I'm going to be here again. How about you just go to a different spot? Oh, okay. You know, and so it was just like that every night. Is it fair to say, though, that most things haven't changed, even from 84 till now? But down the Other board? than the, one of the changes that happened was it was probably 80, in an, around 90-ish, uh, San Diego Border Patrol, one of the, I can't remember which office, got a high-speed chase, and the car hit another car and killed, like, a whole bunch of people in it from the chase. So that San Diego quit doing chases. In fact, Border Patrol doesn't do them much anymore, high-speed chases, which continues today. They still get a few, but I don't know what their matrix is for exigent circumstances to engage in high-speed chase, but that pretty much got shot down around 90, 91. Without getting too political, and, and maybe there is no difference, or you never noticed a difference, did you, when it, new administrations came in, did you ever notice, hey, we're going to really focus on this or we're going to change this? Well, or 85 to 86, they had the, called the Simpson-Mazzoli Bill or the Immigration Reform Control Act. That's where the Democrats and the Republicans got together. They made it illegal to knowingly hire illegal aliens. You're supposed to ask for identification. But to do that, they let like 300,000 illegal aliens in 
and immediately gave them a resident alien card the right to work. The majority, all you had to do was prove that in the last year you'd worked 30 days in the United States. It was something completely retarded. And then they started enforcing the law, doing the inspection. Well, congressmen get involved. When the businessman complains, you just took all my people, I can't do my job. Well, so then they started getting pressure not to enforce it. There are enough laws in the books. It's just a matter of enforcing the laws. And if you really want to stop illegal aliens from coming here, I remember 2009 when the market crashed, there were no jobs. Even the illegals didn't have jobs. They went back to Mexico. It's not about the, that uh, political asylum. It's about, and you can't blame them. I've got an empty stomach. I need to make money. So I don't know how many hundreds of millions of people it is from here to Tierra del Fuego, but they all come up. And you're not going to stop it. You can't stop it. It's just the U.S. government doesn't want to stop it. It's after I got out of DEA, retired, every contracting job I had, they had to do uh, e-verify. If you want to stop illegal aliens, make every employer call in to see if that person has a legally, is either a U.S. citizen or legally entitled to be here. And if you hire them, you go to jail and get fined. You just do e-verify for everybody. All the gov all the companies that have contracts with the U.S. government have to e-verify. I've worked for Khaki, Wexford Group, uh, Spectre Group International, uh, Solutions Group International. They all want it, want e-verified. They've got a government contract. You, they have to show it. It's simple to fix. Then you just make it so you can't hire any. If it, the law said. Not just people have contracts U.S. government on the U.S. government contracts. Have to, everybody has to e-verify. They'll self-deport because they can't get a job. Mm -hmm. Then you go around and make sure, enforce it, and start arresting them all. It's simple. But why would you not come back here? Yeah. Even if you're deported, uh, the ag felon, if you've been deported, you're supposed to get time in prison. They don't enforce it. Now, I enforce it years later when I was DEA. Sometimes guy would been deported two, three times, drug offenses. His re return would bought him, six, no, I think about six to eight years, up to 20, but average was six to eight. Instead of doing the dope deal, we got tires screwing around, we just arrest him, put him in jail as an act felon. Okay, now he gets sent back again. Got just about the same amount of time. So it does work out. But as far as that, until the U.S. population gets tired of it, it's not going to change. It's easy to fix. you know. And then if you made... Uh, I slash HSI do their job or let them do their job and start arresting illegal aliens and sending them back and let Border Patrol do it, they could spend the next probably 100 years, you know, getting all the people out of the United States that are supposed to be here. So fair to say, at least from your perspective, you haven't seen much change from 84 even until today in terms of enforcing the law and doing what really needs to be well, done to take care of the, the problem. The last administration started putting up fences. I mean, when you can't just bonsai and have 200 people run across at once, the reason they put up the fences is to push them way out to the desert where you have to walk 20, 30 miles to get to the nearest freeway road. Well, it's easier to catch them versus when you could just jump across the border at San Ysidro from Tijuana to San Ysidro or uh, Juarez del Paso and you're in the city and you're immediately on the interstate, and you're just disappearing, it, it's easy to hide in the city. It's real hard to hide in the desert. But then, you know, it, it, the activists say, but that's dangerous for them. Okay, you just came through all the way through Mexico or all the way through Central America. That's dangerous too. We cannot be responsible for other people's decisions. If you want to go through the desert and carry water, and take your family, you know there's a good chance that one of your family's gonna die from exposure. I mean, the first real dead person I ever found was a pregnant female who died uh, hiking over the mountains from uh, Tijuana into San Diego County, way up in the mountains, died of exposure. Went and found her, um, you know, the other groups that illegals had covered her face up. She's probably 22 years old, 24, you know, probably seven, eight months pregnant, died of exposure up there and called the sheriff's department that came and got it. That's a regular occurrence. You know, it's not pretty.
I mean, but she'd probably been dead two days the time I found her. So that happened all the time when you were working down there then? Th that happens regularly. It, it happens more now because you're seeing more crossings out in the desert in Texas, especially Arizona. There it's, it happens on a regular basis. Border Patrol has got a great uh, emergency response team with medics that go out and rescue people. But I don't know what to say. It's just people need to be responsible for their own actions. It's horrible. But yeah. you're not gonna you're not gonna stop it. Okay, no matter what. Not until you enforce take away the lure of coming here. And people like their drywall put up cheap and their lawn mowed cheaply, you're not gonna stop that until you make that change. And you need your crops picked. I've always said if you do the if you do the e verify and then give everybody Back in the 60s, there's a pro program called the Bracero Program. Bracero in Spanish means worker. And what they did was they gave people permits to come to the United States and work for like 10 months out of the year, whatever. If you gave all the illegal aliens that want to come here work a permit for, say, 10 months or 11 months, but you have to go back home at least one month a year, and the fee you charge is a fee for it to be smuggled in the United States, then when I was at Border Patrol, it was like, 250 to 500. Now it's much more expensive. Um, but if you charge them $500, they get fingerprint, photograph, come back in two weeks or a month. We will have it all ready for you. And then every, t whenever they, and they can work in, you can do it just certain fields or certain areas or work anywhere. But you don't want it anywhere because you're going to, you know, displace American workers. If you let them do it, you can control the border. You know who's crossing. You have, then photograph, fingerprinted, and any arrest for anything is a lifetime bar. Okay. And you can only do it, let's say, 10 years, because you can't have the same guys working forever in the U.S. You need to get the younger people rotating through. You work 10 years. Right. And we take out taxes. Anyone who tells you illegal aliens pay taxes is lying to you. How? They don't have a Social Security card. If they steal your number, guess who's going to get hit with that bill? You are. And do you think they're going to pay income tax? It's not their number. Okay, they're going to use yours, and they're going to screw you up, or you now have to clear it up and go, I didn't work there. And they're going to use that same Social Security number to, guess what, rent their apartment, get their direct TV. Do you think when they have to go back to Mexico or they get arrested that they're going to pay those bills? No, they just stole your identity, and you're pretty much screwed. So whoever tells you that's lying. I pay, you can't pay your taxes. You don't have a social security number. You have to use somebody else's or a made up one. And excuse me, none of us would pay income tax if we didn't have to. Right. And so they're not going to pay it. They can't pay it. They can't pay their income tax. So they just lie to you on that. Okay. So in 84, uh, you're doing these type of cases and it looks like, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but about 88, 89, you become part of the uh, Border Patrol SWAT team. Is that different than the BC? Well, basically, I went through the Border Patrol's uh, tactical training one or two weeks. I can't remember. But um, so go back. So first of all, I, before I went to the Border Crime Prevention Unit, band of detail, I went to the anti-smuggling team. Well, go back. One. I was getting a lot of, it was causing a lot of grief for my bosses. So they they started a tracking unit. And they sent me to the tracking unit for six months. And what did the tracking unit do? You would track people as they came across the border, like they call it sign cutting, from the Mexican border all the way to the U.S. Uh, we tracked three, four guys that killed a sheriff's deputy trainee, a uh, carjacker, shot her in the back. Oh, they were robbing a store. Their getaway car wasn't there. So they came out after they'd shot up the store out and. El Cajon area, Spring you know, Bonita, California area. Uh, went with a getaway car. It wasn't there. So they come running out, and this female sheriff, deputy slash trainee, it just had her gun issued to her that day in the academy, pulled up, give me your car. She takes off running. They shoot her in the back. They kill her, take her keys, steal her car, and now they're in the getaway car after they tried to rob the bond store. Um, they pull next to a Border Patrol agent, and... He's from Alabama, and but anyway, he uh, checked them out due to the race. Okay, and so then they yell, "Cheese it! Be cool! It's the law!" 
He looks over at that point. High speed chase comes. They bail out of the car. It's probably late evening at that time. It, was, it wasn't dark yet. I remember it. Uh, long story short, we got called in to find him the tracking unit. So we started tracking him through the city and um, even brought out the infrared night scope and ended up catching mostly from the tracking. Uh, breaking the dew in the early mornings all night long, got all three or four of the guys who killed the female sheriff's deputy. So that was pretty much it. I mean, a few high-speed chases, guys with stolen cars, smuggling aliens. The smugglers would go through the canyons. They they had a sense of humor. Like, we'd take the intersection of a trail, rake it, so you could see any footprints coming across. You'd see guys who'd leave a full water bottle with a ribbon tied around it just to say, fuck you to us. We, I got through, but we knew what, how long it would take to each spot. We'd catch them all night. and Usually uh, you'd try to, when you come out of the shadows to catch them in the middle of the night, you'd try to do it near a choya patch that, so they couldn't run away. Nobody likes running through the cactus. It just sucks. I, I don't know how many nights I got cactus in me. So i do that. So I did that. Then I went to the smuggling unit, uh, which was all plain clothes. Uh, following cars that were smuggling aliens across or what they call drop houses or flop houses where the illegals would stay tw 10, 20, 30 minute house. We'd hit the houses, arrest everybody and get the smugglers. Did that for six months. Then a position came up with a border crime prevention unit, the bandit detail. And that detail started in 84. Uh, now it's 88, 89. Um, and I, that's the guys I saw the first night. Uh, in the four and a half years they went, well, go back one. It was generally San Diego PD. Uh, most of the guys there, about half of, were on the SWAT team or been on it. And Border Patrol, about half the team had been on the local SWAT team uh, and, and others. And so it consisted of generally a sergeant and five San Diego police officers a board, two, board patrol supervisor and five board patrol agents. And you'd mix a team up. It'd be half and half. So if you were the PD team, it'd be the sergeant and two, three police officers or two or three board patrol mixed together. And so that was divided into Alpha and Bravo teams. The other team was what they call the Charlie team. And every one of the cops or agents at night would have to take one night a week because you had two off. We'd work five days a week rotating shifts. And you'd be the guy who dropped them off in the Suburban, and you'd carry extra shotguns, rifles, uh, tear gas, smoke in the Suburbans. PD had a Suburban, uh, Borg taught a Suburban, and you're basically the transport guy for the night. So you'd do that. In the generally San Diego PD and Borg Patrol together, for a while, San Diego Sheriff's SED uh, or SCB Special Enforcement Bureau, which was their SWAT team, also worked with Border Patrol chasing the aliens. The whole purpose was to to target people who were raping, robbing, and killing the illegal aliens in the canyon tonight. We called them bandits. At that time, San Ysidro, California, had the highest rape and robbery and assault in the United States per capita in the canyons. I mean, you'd hear women screaming in the canyons at night the whole bit. So that's how the team developed. So all my roommates had done it. My partners had done it. So 88, I asked to go on the team because I've been doing the other stuff, uh, tracking and anti-smuggling. And my supervisor tried to stop me, but the guy who started the team we had been in a Green Beret. So I'll set up a military tactics, recommended me. You had to get approved by your supervisor, then the, another supervisor, then the head of the station. Then it had to go to the assistant uh uh, Border Patrol Chief to get approved. So I went on that. Uh, I did, it was four months on, four months off. So my first tour is at 88. Last tour was into January 19th, 1989. I went to DEA in July. So it just finished. So, but anyway, in the four and a half years, there were three Border Patrol agents shot, one San Diego Sheriff. None died, but a couple of them had been shot up pretty bad, lived, came back to work. Uh, in the four and a half years, it went from 80, with, started mid, early 84, mid, like m spring 84, I guess, sometime in 84. Four and a half years, it, it, the team was involved in 41 shootings, 
shot 41 people and killed 14. In the two tours I was on, we shot 14 people and killed eight. And was this because the bandits were just, they were just bad dudes and they were coming up, they were armed. I mean, how did they work? What was their mentality? There was a thing, a, a, a term was coined at that time, it's called pre-demand violence. So let's say you're an alien smuggler and you got your, let's say 20 aliens, take them through a canyon at two o'clock in the morning. Nobody uses flashlights there. So what it, what they do is it wasn't get down, you know, everybody hands up. Um, generally a two-man team, sometimes more, sometimes one, but generally a two-man team. 20 aliens come down the trail. Their point man steps out in front of the team. The other guy steps in back. First guy there, they just shoot him right in the chest. Drop him. Anybody else moves, I'll kill you too. And then they would rob them all. Um, they would take the women and rape them. I mean, one team wasn't my team. Another team, they came up on a guy. He'd robbed them all. He's shooting the men in the legs just for the fuck of it. And they're screaming. And they got in a running gun battle with him. And he's shooting at them, shooting at him. They actually shot him right between the eyes with a 115 grain nine millimeter hollow point where the round expanded when it went right in between his eyes, looped around inside his skull, didn't kill him. He was in a wheelchair slobbering all of himself after that. And when he went to trial, he goes, I don't remember anything, but in a wheelchair. I mean, mentally damaged for the rest of life, the bad guy. And so I went in the team. I mean, it was every night there was something happening. My first tour, we were in two gunfights. See, the first one was, I think, four or five guys, three or four guys. I was on the cover team, the mobile team that night. They tried to rob the team, and they killed all three of the guys there who tried to rob. I think it was three. There were four. Um, and then the second one, it was alongside the border. And this was my first tour. Again, I was on the cover team. And uh, five guys came up with guns pulled on the five-man team because the, the six man were me and the PD guy. And uh, first guy uh, pulls out a 20, uh, Ruger Red Hawk out of his ba uh, pants. Point man and the t team leader shot and killed him. And then four other guys came at the three guys behind him. One guy couldn't get a shot off because he's on the wrong side of him, the shotgun. So the next two guys in engaged the four. They dropped three of them there. They, one got back to Mexico. So we had, a, out of five bad guys, we had one dead, three wounded, something like that. And uh, the three wounded guys had each been shot two to five times. And they all lived. And so after that shooting, a woman comes across, says, you shot my husband, you shot my husband, blah, blah, blah. And I interviewed her, took her name, move on. So now, you know, but that wasn't, you know, the shootings were in four months too, but that's all we did. Worked at night, hunted the people down. I mean, you know, well, I would say hunted them down. We would sit there, patrol the canyons. They'd jump out of bushes because there's no flashlights on. It's dark. But we have all kinds of stuff. I remember we had cars that drive through the holes in the fence at night. I mean, you name it, we had it going. I remember we had these guys that throw rocks at us. They knew who we were. Every time we'd go through there, they'd throw rocks at us. So we got mad. It's called the U.S. Attorney, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney. He goes, they're doing what? Yeah, he goes, listen, if we don't get this stopped, we're going to have to kill somebody because it really sucks getting hit with a rock, especially when there's like 20 guys throwing rocks at you. And his response was, Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike Wheat. I remember, I'll, I'll, I will prosecute up to 16 of them. So we knew where they're at. They're all high in glue sniffers. They're all illegal aliens from Tijuana. Choto's hanging out there. We came and took them down hard. Both teams together, all 10 of us took down. We probably had 20 guys there, all handcuffed up. So, and they had a fire going. A couple of them started smoking a little bit, got too close to the fire. So we got them out, brought, took 16 of them, took them to jail. He gave them all six months of jail because federal law works. If you get under 180 days, 179 days, you have to spend every day in the federal prison. 100 days, 180 days over because there's no minimum mandatories. They can let them out. So everybody got 179 days, all 16 of them. Message sent, message received. They quit throwing rocks at us. And they're all just glue heads. You know, it's, you, I think one guy had his 
They loved gold spray paint. Why? I don't know. He had it stuck inside his shirt right here with a rag. So And so he goes, fill it, huffing it. And he was just high. It was just retards. I mean, and so that was a typical night. Larry, I'm interested in what you're talking about. I mean, talk about so many shootings, so many violent interactions. So you and I spoke about this. You know, I grew up in the San Diego area a little bit before this time, but I certainly don't remember hearing these types of stories. Clearly it was going on. Do you think, in your opinion, that this same type of stuff is going on today on the border and we're just not hearing it, about it, it? It goes on in other areas. Um, after this occurred, they put up the fence, 90, and they cut down all the bushes and the canyons so it's hard for people to hide. It's just all lit up. At that time, it was bushes we call them hotel bushes. It'd be like six, eight feet where you could stand inside the bush. And that's where all the aliens would hide. And so, you know, the, the bandits would take women out and rob them the whole bit. I remember, I can't remember first or second tour. Um, we had uh, just heard that Border Patrol caught this group. And there's a girl in it, and she'd just been raped by her smuggler. And so we inserted in, and we were leap, leaping and bounding, coming in. We set up, and all of a sudden, we're sitting there hiding in this bush, and some smugglers were there. I forget, I can't remember how they knew who we were, what what they thought we were, but all of a sudden, I hear him yell, "Get rocks, throw rocks!" And it's just raining rocks. So we're sitting here, and the other team's getting rocked. I don't know why to drive them out. And it just rocks are flying. And I hear him go, ow, ow, ow. And I hear him yell, bang him, bang him. So all of a sudden, flashbangs are flying through there. Boom, 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 boom. Me and my partner come out. We go through. All the guys are throwing rocks like a buzzsaw. And we're sitting there, me and this cop are sitting there looking down this guy. And we're got him proned out and, and uh, looking down. I go, hey. I go, remember that guy that we're looking that raped the girl? Yeah. He had stonewashed jeans. Yeah, he's got stonewashed jeans. Had white tennis shoes. Yeah. And he had a white shirt, but this guy's got a blue shirt on. Well, he looked underneath. He had he'd switched. The white shirt now was underneath. And I go, and I think, God, what was his name? I think it was Alejandro. Uh, and I go, I go, ¿Cómo se llama? Alejandro. Oh, Alejandro, you're in trouble now. We cuffed him up, took him there, and had him stand. We had arrested like 20 guys for throwing rocks at us. Standing there, San Diego police comes up. That was our lineup, 20 guys standing there. She walks up, you. She was 14 years old. Her parents had got arrested well, by Border Patrol, uh, and she was in the bush with her smuggler, and he raped her. And uh, she goes, you're the man who raped me right there. Pointed him out of the 20. We all looked over, well, that pretty much covers that night. I mean, you're you're done. Very short arrest report on that one. ID, and that was, I wouldn't say a typical night, but it was pretty consistent with the nights. Larry, it's it's 2020, July 2023. We've just had the, the movie come out about child trafficking. What was your experience on the border in terms of these smugglers, coyotes, uh, with kids and trafficking? Uh, uh, you would, first of all, they would, why somebody do it? I don't know, but they'd give their daughter or child and they'd pay the money to, from a part of the money down. And when the child comes across the U.S. or family member, any family member, they're hold, held in a house and they will hold them hostage until you pay them a smuggling fee. And they may be raped. They may be forced to be to do child labor, whatever. If it's a man, um, they'll start beating them every day and they'll give phone calls. And they'll take Polaroids, Instamatics, because then there were no digital cameras, and send the photos to the family. Either pay the money or we're going to kill them. And that happened all the time. We'd have groups of Chinese come across. Um, God, was it Yugoslavians come across? Koreans come across. And then the standard OTMs, other than Mexicans, Hondurans, Guatemalans, Colombians, you name it. I remember we had a couple Palestinians come across and, you know, they were handcuffed and one guy started spitting in my face. That wasn't a nice thing to do. It was dealt with appropriately. But, um, you know, he written up. I mean, that was typical. 
So that was our first tour. Um, second tour was very lively. Uh, we were out doing a training mission during the day, broad daylight. And one of the guys on our team was a San Diego PD sniper and on the Marine rifle team. So we were in these canyons and we're sitting there and all of a sudden he comes up and he goes, hey, he, he, that night he was called Delta. He was just a sniper. So the teams were a little smaller. He goes, you just had a Tijuana police car. Stop inside Mexico. Was, I can't remember. Let's say it was 284. Car number 284 marked a Tijuana police car. Because you have two Tijuana police officers out of the car and they just entered the United States. And they're walking towards you. What? Yeah, he goes, he goes, I go, and what are they doing? He goes, I'm starting to lose and it's becoming too dark. A request permission to shoot their car. No, you can't shoot their car. Shoot their car. The car's not doing anything wrong. So there are two uniformed police officers that came to the U.S. to rob us. So me and the SWAT sergeant. Wait, wait, wait. Came to rob who? Well, they didn't know we were Border Patrol and San Diego police. We were hiding in bushes. Came to rob us. He comes walking down. One guy comes straight down the hill. The, his partner looped around trying to come in behind us. And so it's just dark enough where a flashlight doesn't work, but just not enough light where you need the light, but you don't need the light. It's not really helping. And he's yelling at one of our teammates, and his name's Herb. He goes, Herb. He's yelling at him, and there's another guy laying down under the bush. And me and the sergeant, one other guy, are in this bush. So it's th three or four of us. And, um, and so he's going, get out of the bush. Takes the gun out. He goes, get out of the bush. He kind of starts pointing the gun to about knee height. Get out of the bush, I'm going to shoot. And her, you can't see him, all he sees just the top of his head. He goes, get out of here. We're in the United States, you can't do anything to us. He says, get out of the bush now. And at that point, the other team, we didn't know it, because you've got two teams, and there's the, the sniper up above. They crawl in close. It, it reminded me of the movie with, with Chuck Norris missing action. He comes out of the water or the M60. And the, the, he only thought there was like one guy in the bush. Two guys pop out there. Three pop out here. Five come up out of another bush. And he screams. Well, at that point, he's taken down real hard. And when we're going, what's your, what, what, what's your partner's name? What's your partner's name? Michael. Michael Miguel. We heard him run. Me and the SWAT sergeant chase. He goes fast as we can. Makes it back to Mexico. Mexico. So we have this Tijuana police officer in uniform, badge and gun, in custody now down in our suburban. We're sitting there, and now we put long guns up because we're on the border. All of a sudden, this uh, unmarked Tijuana police car gets out, and the Comandante gets out with this typical, you know, alligator boots and the white shirt and his Ray-Bans, but now it's night. They don't his shirt. And he takes his 45. I watch him stuff it in the back of his pants. He walks in the U.S. He's inside the U.S. about 20 yards. There's no fence there. Just the border markers. You can see it. Maybe he's in 30 yards. And he comes up to me. And I'm standing. He goes, how dare you come into my country and violate my laws? How dare you uh, take my police officer custody? I'm going to, like I said, very impolitely, said, why don't you go fuck yourself? You're in the United States. Look up there. One guy has a rifle. Another guy down below pointing a shotgun at him. Go, You're in the United States of America right now. I go, I suggest you get back in your country. Oh, shit. And he jogs back to, well, waddles back because he's probably 45 years old and about 70 pounds overweight. And then the fuck you contest starts between the two of us. At that point, my supervisor and the SWAT sergeant come up, Larry go down to the vehicle and quit instigating. He goes, because we're going to get in a gunfight with these cops if you don't. Long story short, at the end of the night, we called the Mexican consul from San Diego, had to come, chief of police. We kept his gun and badge, I think, pretty certain they kept his gun and badge, and gave him back to the Tijuana police with a promise he would never work for the police department again. We should have been arrested. He's damn lucky we didn't kill him. Instead, and that was being considered as he's pointing a gun at the, my, our partner, but it went off smoothly. That kind of set the tone for the next four months because it was night after night of just wild, crazy stuff. How common was it to deal with police officers coming across from Mexico? Uh, we that was only one we arrested. Another team got in a gunfight and shot a Tijuana police officer. I think they killed him. Another 
off duty Tijuana. That one was on duty. The other three instances I know, I know four instances, that one and three others. One, the cop was on duty. He went to the head of the team and basically it was a screw you contest. And he stepped forward, had the gun put against his chest. He goes, I got body armor on. You don't. Let's do it. The native speaker, that guy got arrested. Then the one off duty, he got shot and killed. And the other one um, is the same guy, the portal supervisor. He were, they were robbing people all night. They went to arrest him. Um, the border agent got shot, was above the guy, skylighted. He took five rounds, two in his vest, just over the side panels, right above the side of the heart, one under the vest, vest through the stomach, lodged right next to the spine, one through his arm, and one through his scrotum and out his ass. Uh, didn't take off his testicles, but uh, in the gunfight, he stood standing. The one cop button hooked and shot the bad guy in the face and killed him. And uh, the board trade that that happened to, he was in the hospital for about a month, got out and went back to work. Then that's one. Then another board patrol agent, he got shot in the ass and the ankle. Um, another board patrol agent chasing a guy. A guy shoots over his shoulder, shoots him in the mouth, blows out his jaw, lodges his neck. Then we had one sheriff's deputy get shot, blew out his femur. Guys charging them with a gun, shooting at him. They returned fire and killed the bad guy. But were these all bandits or were these actually police officers from Mexico that you guys are getting shootings with? Uh, well, the first four um, were all cops. The other, I'm just telling you about the other Border Patrol agents who got shot. So three Border Patrol agents. Three? Yeah, and one uh, San Diego shot. Sheriff's deputy got shot. I'm sorry. Maybe maybe I'm, I'm confusing uh, the question here. I, I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is you're, you're telling the story about those Mexican police officers coming across. Right. How often did that happen where Mexican police officers? Four times. Oh, oh so you are talking. Okay. Yeah, wow. Okay. That was four times. And then after I told you about the Border Patrol supervisor mm -hmm. got shot, then there were three other guys who got shot separately, but that wasn't just other gunfights. Wow. Okay. So how often besides police from Mexico, how often did you guys encounter uh, cartel members? Cartel, I think we seized. No, we never got a load of, maybe we got one load of drugs. I can't remember. That could have been before or after. It's been so long now. But um, I'm thinking. We never got any drugs. It was, we got a few loads of drugs, but not cartel type, you know, like a couple hundred pounds here, a couple hundred pounds there. We got a lot of fugitives. Um, remember another group that was throwing rocks at us? We took down four of them one night and talked to them. And one of them had a federal warrant for marshals out. I think it was for drugs. So he went to prison. The other three guys, we sent them back to Mexico. So basically talked to them that keep throwing rocks, you're going to get killed. Quit throwing rocks. You know, because that's, you know, rock, I think, was probably the first weapon ever used by man. And these guys, I've seen them throw rocks and kill rabbits with them. So they're they're pretty good. That's just common. I mean, so that, that was four months. We would work mostly night shift. Other than that, first one was a day shift. You know, and that, we were, that guy's just lucky to be alive. We should have killed him. We didn't. But... Um, would have caused a lot of problems politically every time you shoot a TO on a police officer. It's not that it would have been the first time, because like I said, it happened two, three other times. But we ended up getting three more, three gunfights that tour. Actually, I was in all three of them. And mm -hmm. just, you know, I mean, shooting at us, shooting at them. Let's see, the first one it was about a month after that. We were walking down the trail, just walking there at night, and I was usually number three carried the flares and all the med equipments and extra radios. And I'm looking over. And I, I think I was like, I saw him. This guy sitting beside the trail. But um, he's not looking north. He's looking south. Because I go, what? War Patrol comes from the north. Why are you looking south? We keep walking by him. I'm thinking, I go, this doesn't make sense. All of a sudden, a guy pops out of a bush and pulls up a rifle. Point man pills off the left. Swat, swat. Sergeant pulls off the left. There's nobody covering right. And also he pulls up the rifle and 
all five of us open up the guy and drop him right there and kill him. I mean, he must have been shot 14, 15 times. So the first guy was looking for the second guy? What, what, he's, what he's doing, the first guy's looking south for aliens coming up to rob them. Oh, okay. Because okay. that's what I'm going with. He should be looking north, worried Got about it. where Border Patrol is, where he's going to go. And that's as processing that information, go, this doesn't make sense. And then he ran away. He didn't stay to help his buddy who died most gloriously, um, <laughs> getting shot up there, pulled a rifle on us. So, so these were two bandits waiting to do the same people. thing, rob, rape, kill, yeah. the whole thing. And so we'd get reports of where all the robberies were ha happening and the rapes. And so the second time we're sitting there, and so, and then after every shooting, you got to go through homicide and it's an all night affair and take your photo and your blood type and interview you. It's a, it's, it's a long night. And so, and then you can't go back to work to see the shrink. You got to see the shrink within 72 hours. After you see the shrink the first time, then you're allowed to uh, go back to work. And then to get cleared, you have to see him a second time within two weeks. It was actually a woman. So we finished all that up. Go back on, and we're arresting guys, smuggling. Our job is never for smuggling any drugs we catch or just basically making sure nobody had can uh, guns in the can uh, canyons and stuff. And I remember one night, I like to tell you every night was a gunfight, but there was also a lot of skullduggery and buffoonery that we did on our part. So there's a the, the raw sewage would flow from T1 in the United States and then have these little bridges come across. We called them trolls or toll masters because they charge like 50 cents to come across the avenue and have to go through the raw sewage. And most of them were doing the robberies. So we decided to go across and there's this troll and he's got his radio going, yet and yet and yet and yet and you know, he's charging people. But when there's no Nobody looking. Usually he has a knife or a gun hidden in a bush nearby. They'd ra rob people. So we decided to go across and get him. So I'm a halfway across a, the bridge, and my partner's halfway across my bridge. And the other guy, it was a support patrol agent because he's the only guy to be stupid enough to do this, decides to throw a rock and splash the illegal alien. Well, from when the rock leaves his hand into the water, it didn't go where he thought. The only two guys who got hit with the raw sewage was me and my partner. As I was going, no, dog. And now we're just mouthful of raw sewage. And I am chasing. Now, forget the guy we were going to go talk to and check to have a gun. We're chasing our partner around. Going to beat his ass for getting a whole mouthful of raw That was just so disgusting. I was spitting and rinsing out all night long and just soaked in raw sewage. What a fucking dick. It was just a dick move. <laughs> And so that finishes. Okay, so that was a that's more of the typical night. Another night, we were walking, and somebody had stole a nativity scene Jesus. Okay, obviously this was around Christmas, right? And it's put on top of this hill. There's rocks around it, and then they take Colgate toothpaste and put it around the rim of his shoulders and stuff to make it kind of glow. And we're looking, going, "What the fuck? What is that?" So we go up there because it's in the you know, middle of the night. All we see is this guy standing there. And we're going to go up and kick his ass for looking at us wrong. It's a nativity scene, Jesus. And the sergeant goes, okay, it's right before Christmas. Everybody take your hats off, say a prayer to, to, to God. And then one of the guys, I'm Jewish. Do I still have to say a prayer? Yes, you've got to say a prayer too. And I'm going, I'm looking and I'm going, how did we just get to this really screwed up scene now? Nativity scene, Jesus. So we finish our mission, go back. And like some nights we'd like 10, 20 miles to the canyons. So next night we go in, we go to the same place. Well, somebody kicked nat nativity scene Jesus' ass and threw him down and was the bottom of this creek bed, dry creek bed. So we were talking to aliens all night. Hey, did you kick Jesus' ass? And they go, what are you talking about? And then we split. no, we didn't kick Jesus' ass. Well, let us know. You can't kick Jesus' ass. We put the nativity scene back, whoever put it there. That was really a typical night. I remember one night we were looking for this. We want to be the first team to arrest a female bandit. Because we get reports of two to three cholos raping women, and there's a female cholo with them, or chola, hold the woman down while they took turns raping the women. She had digitally penetrated the whole bit. And so one night we find this chola up there in the canyons, 
and she's with two other dudes. We take them down hard. No guns, nothing. And I remember saying, Blake, you motherfuckers, I'm a woman and I'm pregnant. We're 90% positive was her, but no guns, nothing else. And we nobody we had no victims because that was long weeks, months before with other illegal aliens. But that was pretty much a typical night there. Hmm. Just you'd sit there in canyons. Um, in fact, what we did is in a show called High Risk in 1988. They had the last writer's strike. Remember, now the writers are on strike now. So they had a TV show that came out with us. And they were with us one or two nights. And the third night, they didn't decide not to come out. And that's when I got that first gunfight. And we shot the guy that night and killed that guy. And so if you ever want to watch the TV show, it's on Netflix off and on. It's called High Risk. It's episode... Three or four, I always get confused, but it's at the 20-minute mark. You'll see me on the team talking, and the other guys were maneuvering. It's with low-light cameras came out with us. Mm. Nothing eventful happened, but you'll see the aliens in the in, in the canyons at night, and you'll, you'll hear them yelling, canela, you know, hot cinnamon spice tea. They'll be, even in the U.S., cooking fires, roasting chicken, and selling it. And so that's how those things worked. I remember one time, not on the band of detail, but I arrested this guy, kid, who had a big cooler full of burritos. He goes, oh, I'm not going to get to sell many. Yes, you will. What? I put him in the cell with like, like 150 dudes in there. They're all hungry. I said, if anyone robs you or takes any burrito without them paying, let me know. So he was happy to get arrested. He sold all of his burritos an hour. Can I go back now? No, you've got to wait till the end of the ship. Oh, I go, Listen, it's a lot safer than doing it here in the canyon getting robbed. That's true. Can you, like, arrest me every night? No, I can't arrest you every night. I just did it because you were there when everybody else got hooked up. So he sold all the burritos that night, like, in literally 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. He probably had 100 of them in this big cooler. So, anyway, go back to banded details. So that happened. Let's see. Next major gunfight was, first was October. Next was right before Christmas. Um... So we're, let's see, we're sitting in this area, the exact same area where I told you, remember they shot the four out of the five guys, the prior team. We're sitting there and we're standing this, and this illegal alien comes up and he recognizes who we are. He goes, listen, you got to be careful out here tonight. Why? He goes, I want you to know, see that fire um, over there? Yeah, well, that where that fire's at, when it gets quiet, and there's not a lot of people out, they take turns for raping the girls as they come through there. There's too many witnesses, they don't do it. It was two nights ago, uh, no, it was about a week or two before that, they'd raped a 14-year-old girl and shot another guy who tried to stop it. And we knew about it, we'd heard about it. Really? Because yeah, it's over by this fire. He goes, yeah, and then there's this other group that goes around robbing people, and he's telling us about it, about these five guys. And so I'm just standing there, and our point man's standing there, and the rest of the team's on, kind of on a knee. Or I think I was, no, I was on a knee. Only the point man was up talking. All of a sudden, he looks over his shoulder. He goes, and here they come. And he's gone. I go, what the fuck is going on? And there's five guys running single file on the levee. And they've got guns in one hand. And two, three of them have flashlights. And they're probably about 10 to 20 yards away at the middle canyon. Right? Not canyon. It was flat area, but in the ambient light was coming from Tijuana across. They start coming off, coming across embankment. Bang! Bang! Start shooting at us. And at that point, you have no option to return fire. And we all of us shoot the first two guys. We kill them. Um, of the other three guys, I shot the third one in the hip. I saw him take the round of the hip, crawl back. Uh, he made it back to Mexico. The other two might have been shot. I don't think so. But so we had two killed, and I shot the third on the hip. And I found out later when I was in DEA that he was wounded, went back to Mexico. So we, we killed the two guys there. They each got shot 14, 15 times. It's all five of us were shooting. And so it's funny, we're sitting there in the office. I said, Hey, this woman wants to talk to you about shooting her husband. So I sat down with her, interviewed her, and go, God, I know her from someplace. You killed my husband. You killed my husband. I guess of the guys that made it back, they watched him 
you know, be put on the gurney and a sheet put over him and all the way. So he knew he was dead. I know her for some place. So I finished it. So we finish up. And homicide comes in and interviews us. It was a same, this is a different team. Uh, that team comes in later. So he goes, hey, Larry, man. He goes, you should know that woman. I go, God, she's familiar. He goes, remember the guy you shot six, uh, six months ago? He goes, four months on, four months off. Six, seven months ago. Yeah. Well, you interviewed her when you wounded her husband. This time, the husband just got out of jail, got six months in jail for armed robbery. The first time, came back, tried to rob us at the same time, exact same place, exact same number of dudes. This time, we killed him. I interviewed the wife the first time and the second time. And one of our guys on this team was the same guy who was in the shooter on the first team. And we talked about recidivism. Like, well, he won't do that another time, I guarantee you. So we actually shot the same guy twice in six months. Doing the exact same thing. Exact same thing people. at the exact time, at the exact same place, within 30, 40 yards. Larry, how old are you at, you know, toward the end there, it's 89. How old are you at that time? I am 30. Okay, so you're 30. You've never had any prior military experience and everything else, but you are – you're clearly in the shit at that point, right? Is this taking a toll on you at all, mentally? No, no toll. I've never lost any sleep. Uh, yes, the first gunfight, at that, by the end of this tour, I've been in three gunfights. I'll get some later in my career. Um, but what it is, it explained to me by the shrink, actually did the best job explaining it to, to me. So the first gunfight, you know, we went out, had beers afterwards, hadn't been asleep in two days, go to sleep, I'm trying to go to sleep, and the video starts over and over and over. So I went to see the psychologist. She goes, okay, first thing, when you're in a fight or flight situation and you're in a gunfight, she goes, your body dumps adrenaline, what's it, glucose, endorphins, and keflins into your system. Look at it this way. It's racing fuel for a car, and it's inside your body. <clears throat> That's why you didn't sleep. So when you get out of here today, I want you to go to the gym. Do not do any weightlifting. Don't do uh, anaerobic. Do aerobic exercises to burn it out of your system. And guess what? Went and ran a 5K. I've been running every day because I was I applied for DEA. I was waiting to go. Went and ran a 5K. In fact, I might have even done six miles that day, five or 10K. Came in, slept like a baby that night. And then after that, from then on, whenever I got a gunfight, let's just go work out immediately after stuff like baby. And that, like my last gunfight was three years ago, two and a half years ago in Afghanistan. Immediately after, went to the gym. I worked out. I did about 45 minutes on the elliptical. Went and did it. Took a nap afterwards. Colonel's like, you okay? All good. Just another day at work. So... That finished up, so we were off the three, four days, went back to work again, checked out more guns. And then two weeks later in the day, uh, and I'll tell you after this, there was a price to pay in marriage because my wife had a boyfriend. <laughs> but um, we are sitting there at that fire I told you about where that guy, before he took off running, told us they were raping girls. We're sitting there, two teams, my team sitting there, other teams in another spot blocking, watching. And all of a sudden, they come up, check us out. And it's a long story. I'll just give you the Go into Mexico, two guys, come back with four. And I'm on the far right side of the five-man team. And uh, I see them come in. They huddle. They're probably 15, 10 yards away, plus or minus. And then they leave one guy to the right, and I'm watching him. And I told the other guy's team, hey, go cover your AOR. Um I go, I've got the shotgun, the chop shotgun on me, the two pistols. We always carry two guns for backups. At that point, I had two guns up now in homicide, so I'm running out of guns, having to check out more. And my partner had been just in a gunfight with me two days, two weeks earlier. He goes, we got you, buddy. It's like that. And I'm going either way, shotgun. He goes, I just get the fuck out of my way. Got you. All of a sudden, they leave one guy behind us. I'm going, okay, they're about to hit us. And all of a sudden, the the two guys keep going, but they just keep going past. I go, well, maybe they're not going to do anything. They're going to pick up illegal aliens, you know? I look, the guy to the right of me is now walking forward, pulls up the bandana up to his eyes here. 
starts pulling out a 12 inch butcher knife, which looks like a machete from his waistband coming at me. And I hear, get down, motherfucker. I think in Spanish. Or maybe just don't move. What one, one of the gunfights with blah, blah blah. And so I looked to my left and this the two guys button hooked. One has a metal rod about, I guess about a yard long, sharpened to pe- uh, points at each end with tape like a mini javelin in his hand. The other guy's got a sharpened Phillips screw, screwdriver, like an ice pick. And they put it against about the, at the far left end, partner's throat, hold it there. And then the guy behind us is now coming at the let the middle guy with another sharpened filled scooper screwdriver to ice pick a point like an ice pick with a leather thong around it stuck to his arm and gloves on charging him guy in the left boom knocks away goes pop pop double taps uh one bad guy takes round through his uh, the thorax heart out another one just higher through the lungs he runs about a hundred yards he's dead he just doesn't know it and the kid with him takes off running, runs into the other team, and gets taken down super hard, super super hard. Guy in the middle charges my buddy. He rolls over his stomach, opens up with a three fifty seven, shoots a guy above the heart in the chest here. Turns a run. He gets around. I think it went in through his butt, came out of his belly button, dropped him. He actually lived. And then my guy's coming at me, and I shoot one hand of the shotgun, miss, rack it quickly. And with a sawed-off shotgun, um, you lose your night vision real fast. And saw the silhouette shot, and he took the headshot uh, with a shotgun blast, dropped him. I go up, cuff him up real quick. He's dead with a you know bandana across his face, actually a scarf. But everybody went chasing all the other guys that all land that way. They're like 100 yards away. I'm sitting there by myself, and all the natives are. And this was like right on the fence with Mexico. All the natives are coming up real restless and like, okay, I ain't got no help here. You know, I mean, got my shotgun and a couple pistols, but that ended that. That was uh, January 3rd. And then our rotation in your, into January 19th. And uh, they canceled the team because it became too violent, too much risk. So, Larry, what? We'll- was it just greed on the bandits' part coming back time and time? Because they had to have known you guys were out there. Oh, they knew. They called us Little SWAT. And it, I, we'd, we'd talk to guys who couldn't tell who we were in the canyons at night. Go be careful. Little SWAT, they don't care about your smuggling. If they catch you with a knife or gun, you're going to not like what they're going to do to you. They, they don't care about smuggling. But there was no deterrent from you guys being out there. They just we kept were, doing we it. We were the only deterrent. Okay. I mean, and it was the only federal state ta- uh, tactical task force. We weren't a SWAT team. I like to use the words tactical team. Leaping and bounding, wagon wheels, uh, L- L-shaped ambush, so you're shooting so you don't shoot each other. Uh, the original Lions and Shadows a couple of times shot each other. They deny it, but they did. Um, we never had that problem. Very disciplined. I mean, there were another... Four or five times we should have been shooting, he didn't. I got shot at one night, you know. And I'll tell that story in a second, but it didn't. It it deterred him. I mean, let's face it: only tactical team in the United States, and in four years, four and a half years, forty-one shootings, killed fourteen. Hmm. What um, you were just you wanted to tell the story? I just- uh, so what, th- th- this is a. First or second tour, I can't remember. So we're walking the same area where these gunfights were. And I didn't know it then. I found out later. Um, the were the Mexican Federal Judicial Police. It was called MFJP at the time. It changed from AFI to Preventina, Preventiva to SSP, various names. But their version of the FBI in Mexico. Well, I didn't know it then. I knew it was general area. But later, because I put him for DEA, so in July I go to DEA. Uh, but th- so we're sitting there. We see this guy coming to Mexico, in the U.S. from Mexico. We're in a very nice leather jacket. It's probably 10, 11 o'clock at night on a Friday or Saturday night. And he said something to me, being Billy Badass. I, I told him in Spanish, go fuck yourself. He goes, listen, I'll fire a gun. I'll shoot you. I go, fuck you. You haven't got no gun. You're full of shit. Let's go back for a Spanish. I'm standing up on this embankment, and the rest of the guys are kneeling down and laying down. 
He goes, I'll shoot. I go, you haven't got fucking the balls to shoot. I dare you to do it. We go about three more fuck you contests back. And all of a sudden he goes, oh, yeah? Bam! Shoots at me. I'm like, mother. Now I take my gun. I'm going to shoot him. And the sergeant goes, no, you can't. I go, why? Larry, there's all the houses behind him. And all the cars are going to Rosarito and Ensenada to go get food, uh, dinner tonight. You can't, we can't have a gunfight right here on, right next to the highway in New Mexico. Well, what's the point of this job? If somebody shoots at me, I can't shoot back. He goes, you cannot shoot him. <sighs> okay. And the guy walks past the other team. And, they, and he sees him in the bush. And the, one of the, the native speakers goes, what's going on? He goes, that guy's crazy. I think that's kind of where I got a nickname out of. I don't know what that was for, but long story short, that was a typical Border Patrol weekend. So finish that tour. The team gets disbanded. I do regular Border Patrol work um, for the next six months. So I think it was about June. I get hired by DEA and turn in my stuff on Monday and spend – End of June, 1st of July. It was begin again, 1st of July. Uh, and I go to the DEA Academy of Quantico. This has been Reasons We Serve, a channel dedicated to the women and men in law enforcement. Please like, share, subscribe, and leave comments. Reasons We Serve can be found on other audio platforms to include Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to watch these interviews, they can be found on YouTube, Rumble, Vimeo, and Spotify.